Hey there everybody, this is Sam here from the Samuel Plays Brass channel. Hope you're all doing well, and today I would like to talk to you about this Giardinelli New York B10 mouthpiece. So without further ado, stay tuned for this episode of Mouthpiece Spotlight. My initial googling efforts came back totally fruitless. I could not find any information online about this mouthpiece. So I took to my secret weapon, the Facebook group Horn People, where several Horn People, in fact, came to my aid and helped me discern a few key things about this mouthpiece. Firstly, it was designed for Myron Bloom, former principal horn of the Cleveland Symphony, professor of horn at IU Jacobs School of Music, and Hans Hoyer performing artist. Not a bad reputation. He just recently died a few years ago after a very long and fruitful life, and so this is quite a piece of history as a result. The letter, in this case B, on a Giardinelli mouthpiece indicates the cup and artist for which that cup was designed. We have this information now thanks to John Dutton. B refers to Myron Bloom as we saw. C refers to Jim Chambers. F refers to the one and only Philip Farkas, very surprised to learn that. G refers to Gunther Schuller. J to Jimmy Stagliano, and S to Joseph Singer. It seems there's a little bit of competition for the letter S, and uh, it seems that Joe beat both Schuler and Stagliano to the letter S, so unfortunately they didn't quite get their way. The Chambers Cup, to my understanding, is by far the most popular. This is the only non-C Giardinelli mouthpiece that I've seen. Everything else has been a C8, a C12, a C15, etc. Uh, this is the only time I've seen something that isn't a C. If I may go on a bit of a tangent about Gunther Schuller, he spent a long time right here in Spokane, Washington. The world is very, very small. I've heard stories of his conducting and direction from multiple of my trumpet teachers who played for him in the Spokane Symphony when he would come and conduct. I was very surprised to see that he was a Giardinelli mouthpiece artist and had a cup designed for him, even though I've never seen a G mouthpiece in the flesh. Now, as for this B cup specifically, it is quite deep. It's kind of on the order of magnitude of a Holton Farkas, either DC or VDC, somewhere in between. I don't consider that to be excessively deep. Some people might, but it really depends on your horn and the style of music that you play, etc. The inner diameter of the B cup, I find to be fairly small, certainly. It's a lot smaller than what I would generally play on. And uh, Eli Cronenberg notes that it is a little bit smaller, narrower that is, than the Chambers Cup. Now, one of the few reliable pieces of information that I now know on Giardinelli mouthpieces that I really hadn't expected is that the number, in this case 10, actually refers to the throat diameter of the mouthpiece, which is the diameter of that hole there where you see the light passing through and you see the wall on the other side. In this case, it's a number 10 uh, and on the US drill chart, and that's sort of what the designation refers to. Horn mouthpieces can range from number one to number 18 throats. A one is a 0.2280 inch diameter, and then the 18 is a 0.1695. Because this is a deeper cup, it tends to have wider throats. So actually the 10 is the most constrictive uh, bloom throat offered, and it is a 1935, 0.1935 inches in diameter. A neat feature of this mouthpiece is that it actually has a screw on rim. That's right, all you do is grasp the rim and twist, and it comes off of the rest of the body of the mouthpiece. The Giardinelli uh, screw threads are actually considered kind of universal in the horn world, from what I understand, which is really neat. But this is where we hit an interesting wrinkle. Eli speculates that, in a separate comment, that this rim is actually mismatched. It is supposedly a chambers rim on a bloom cup. And that got me really interested. I was interested to figure out how he knew that. And then I realized something. There's a slight lip inside the mouthpiece between rim and cup, which in of itself is nothing unusual, but it's a certain kind of lip that makes it look like the inner diameter of the rim is ever so slightly wider than the inner diameter of the cup. It's very slight. It's probably only 0.2 millimeters on a side, and so it's hardly even perceptible. But if you double that, that means the diameter of the chambers is actually 0.4 millimeters wider than that of the bloom cup that it's attached to, which checks out because Eli noted in a separate comment that the chambers has a slightly wider inner diameter. What I will say about this rim, be it a bloom, a chambers, or heaven knows what else, is that it's a really nice rim, even though I don't prefer the inner diameter particularly. It's narrow, but not excessively so, and it has a very nice contour to it. There's a very slight inward contour, as though it's supposed to sort of meld to the curvature of your face or your chops. It's not as necessary for a narrow horn. It's moments like these where I'm thankful to have a carpeted floor in here. My ineptitude amazes even me sometimes. It's not as necessary for a narrow horn mouthpiece as it would be for, you know, a wider trombone or tuba mouthpiece, but that contour is very comfortable and very thoughtful. 
Hey, it's slightly more recent, Sam. I wanted to make a bit of a clarification because when I returned this mouthpiece to Vern, I had a little bit of a conversation with him and I mentioned the lip in the rim and he acknowledged it. He said, this rim does fit Chambers cups a little bit better, but it's actually not a Chambers rim, if you can believe it. It was actually designed for yet another Giardinelli artist and that's Robert Johnson. Now, Johnson was one of Vern's many teachers throughout his illustrious career. And he was also assistant principal horn of the New York Philharmonic under Leonard Bernstein. Not bad, huh? Anyway, Vern also, I just wanted to mention, affectionately refers to this mouthpiece as his B-10 bomber. I just think that's kind of cute. Anyway, back to our normally scheduled programming. The last worthy specification of note is the shank on this mouthpiece, which is designed to fit the Euro shank receiver on European horns, as opposed to the large Morse taper of some more modern American horns. And that sort of checks out because we mentioned that Myron Bloom was a Hans Hoyer performing artist, so he would have been playing on European horns that take slightly narrower shanks. So if you try and drop this into a Con 6D, for instance, it's not going to fit quite right. It'll go a little too far in, but on my slightly older 8D, it actually fits quite nicely. All right, I think I've talked for long enough and you've now earned a playing excerpt, so I will treat you to one now on the Giardinelli B10. I would say this mouthpiece has a good blend of clarity and depth throughout the register. It's a little bit tougher down low for me than some wider internal diameter mouthpieces that I play on, things like the Dennis Wick 4N or the Yamaha 35C4, just because that's more my cup of tea, more what I'm used to. I like to use as much of my chops as possible on horn, just feels a little bit better. <laughs> But in any case, it's a fairly balanced feel. It's not the largest, most Teutonic sound you can possibly produce on a horn. But in any case, I find it to be fairly balanced. I say balanced, bearing in mind that this is probably better for crusty style horns than Geyer style horns. Geyer styles tend to like slightly more bowl-shaped mouthpieces rather than the almost straight V cup that we find on this mouthpiece. And so it might cause a Geyer to tub out a little bit and that wouldn't be very well balanced. But I like the way it feels on Con and crusty style horns. An important note here is that this mouthpiece, unlike some deeper mouthpieces such as my Dennis Wick, does not cause the pitch to sag in the higher register. I've had that issue on some mouthpieces that I've played, and I thought this might have the same issue since it's quite deep, but it actually stays up on top of the pitch really nicely, which I appreciate. <laughs> I find it really unfortunate that Giardinelli didn't seem to allow much customizability in terms of internal diameters. It feels like they kind of just gave you the artist's preference and made you stick with that. I would feel better about using Giardinelli mouthpieces because I really do like them, but I wish they had, you know, an 18 millimeter diameter option. I'd like that, frankly, a lot more because that's what my Dennis Wick is and that's generally my preferred size on most horns. And this is probably more in the realm of 17 millimeters, which is more like my trumpet sizes, uh, sometimes even smaller than what I use on trumpet. And I just prefer to use a little bit more of my chops on horn because my embouchure is more furled out and 17 millimeter diameters do tend to feel a little bit small. Nevertheless, it seems that Giardinelli's focus was more on throat size, which is highly unusual in my experience, but kind of interesting. I wish I had some more different throated mouthpieces to experiment with here just to see the effects. But that was one of their focuses and the other was kind of the general cup shape that the artist preferred. It also seems that they had some rim customizability considering a lot of their mouthpieces were screw rimmed, such as this one. So you were actually able to alter the feel of the mouthpiece at least, if not necessarily the size so much. In any case, this is a really, really interesting mouthpiece and I've enjoyed spending some time with it. I'd like to thank the following folks whose names are scrolling below from the Facebook group Horn People for setting the record straight on this mouthpiece. This video absolutely would not have been possible without them because I really wanted to do a video on this mouthpiece, but as I said, Google told me nothing useful about it. So I'm very thankful for these folks here and also to Vern Wyndham for allowing me to borrow and do a video on this mouthpiece. In any case, if you've enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and a comment down below. We've got more mouthpiece spotlights coming up, so if that's what you want to stay tuned for, make sure to also check that you're subscribed to the Samuel Plays Brass channel, unlike the vast majority of my viewers. So, if you find yourself in that majority, no pressure, but subscribing is a small gesture with a huge impact on the channel, and like I said, we've got more mouthpiece spotlights coming in the near future. Thank you so much for watching, this has been Sam of Samuel Plays Brass, reviewing the Giardinelli B10. Until next time, we'll see you on the flip side.
Thanks for watching everybody. If you want to support the creation of bigger and better content on the Samuel Plays Brass channel, have your name featured right here, and a whole host of other perks and benefits, then please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. For now, you can find more videos in the end screen cards to my left.